Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman and Reagan Canope. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. I'm running for mayor because this is obviously a pivotal point in our city's history. I believe that Portland's best days are still ahead. However, if we don't start to get the city back on the right track, we really could enter a doom spiral. And Mm -hmm. I believe that the actions that our next generation of leaders take are going to determine the future of Portland. I believe that I have the values and the leadership and the vision to actually help stand up our new form of government and make sure that it works for the people of Portland. All right, folks. Uh, Today, we were excited to bring back a friend of the podcast, Portland City Commissioner Mingus Maps. This is his second time on the podcast. Uh, We linked to the first episode, if you haven't heard it already, in the description. It starts with a bit of a get to know you before we get into the questions. In this episode, we go straight into um, some policy and politics questions, starting with why he is running for mayor at a moment where the mayoral job description is shrinking. Um, and we talk about charter reform. We talk about the governor, Tina Kotek, Congressman Earl Blumenauer letter, where they kind of blasted the, the mayor and the county government. Um, and we talk about what he thinks about where Portland is, is at today. Uh, Reagan, this was your first time chatting with Commissioner Maps. What did you think? Well, I thought he was great. Um, I think it's important for our viewers and then our listeners who can't see. I have a different background today, and it's just because I get to happen to use my wife's uh, desk, which has just a plain white background. And I'm also wearing a great shirt, uh, which is a Hawaiian shirt that I got from Old Navy on uh, discount. So uh, anyway, things are really looking up for at least this episode of the podcast. I'll probably be back in my office with a horrible wallpaper at some point, and the YouTube commenters can destroy me. But um, no, I think... (laughs) As a Republican, um, our feelings about Portland are very are very difficult, Ben. Um, and I kind of highlighted this in the podcast a little bit. A lot of Republicans don't Portland my Oregon, don't Portland my Central Oregon, don't Portland my whatever, right? Clackamas County. But I think that there's and and I did I meant to talk about this in the episode, but there's a lot of Republicans I know who who loved Portland and miss old Portland and want Portland to, you know, be the the city that it was. Um, A lot of people think of it as that, you know, a shining city on a hill. And so I think that it would be a mistake to um, just write off the biggest city in Oregon. And I think that if we understand the politics, understand what's going on there with voters, understand the sentiments, understand the, the region, it's important for Republicans to be able to govern the whole state and understanding where Portland is at and, you know, having the opportunity to try to compete in elections, even if it's not for city uh, commission, I think that matters. And so I think that that's why it was super useful and super important for me to have this conversation um, with Commissioner Maps is just because his, I think his perspective is one that isn't um, so hardly governed by ideology that he can't talk about the good and the bad. And that's what I really appreciated about him and his approach. And, and I think will be really interesting to see his campaign. Um, and I don't know that there's any other candidates announced yet that I'm aware of. So he'll, there, there will probably be some contrast there in the, the way they talk and the things that they focus on. And so that'll be super interesting to watch. And Ben, as we were finished recording this episode, I went to the candidate tracker and I put Portland on there and I put Mingus on the list for mayoral candidates and I put a council section that I'm going to update later after I do some more research. Um, so just a reminder for our, uh, if you're a subscriber to OR360, um, that's the OregonWay.substack.com. You can use our candidate tracker and keep up to date on everybody who's running. Thank you for adding the Portland section. Um, what I will say before we jump into the interview is what strikes me about Mingus and what I really like about him is like his sense of optimism comes through consistently throughout, like even talking about hard subjects and even mm-hmm. to your point, acknowledging like that things are not always great uh, in Portland and some things still need work. Like he does have this relentless, like we're going to get, it's going to get better. And this is how, and this is what we're going to do. Um, and I think there will be some skeptics about that message. Like, obviously I think folks in your party in particular are not super bullish on the future of Portland. Um, but, no. uh, but, but, I think Mingus Maps genuinely is, uh, and I think, I think people need that. People need something to believe in. People need a, a vision. People need a sense of hope and optimism. So I, I'm glad that he is giving that uh, to voters. And I'll be anxious to see who else jumps in the race for mayor. And of course, we would 
uh, welcome additional conversations on this podcast. But Reagan, any closing comments before we dive into the interview? I think you're kind of looking at the two Portlands. You're kind of looking at the the kind of um, more hardline version of public policy. And then you look at the folks who just want to make the government out there work. And I think as those two ideologies fight, Portland is is suffering because of that. And if one of them can actually gain a stronghold and push an agenda, you're going to see some significant changes. But until that happens, I think them being stuck so far in the middle of that and also having this battle about what the the form of the government is going to be is just has made it just 10 times more challenging. And so I think, you know, Commissioner Maps kind of alluded to some of those things getting resolved starting in 2025. And so it'll be interesting to kind of watch those um, unfold. Yeah, he he mentioned that the the charter reform is going to solidify here around November of this year, not of next year. So we intend to have him back to have that conversation. Uh, but without further ado, we will dive right into the episode. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you back here next week. Now that the legislative session is over, it's time for Oregon's activists, candidates, and political committees to turn their attention to the 2024 elections. With government regulation of political activities becoming more complicated nearly every year, and with political actors increasingly initiating complaints and litigation to achieve political goals, having experienced legal counsel has become critical to success in the political arena. Harang Long PC has represented clients involved in candidate and ballot measure elections for decades. To learn more about Harang Long's political law practice, check out our website at harangue.com. That's www.harrang.com. Commissioner Mingus Maps, thanks for coming back on the podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me here. We are excited to follow up on our previous conversation. We will link to the first conversation we had with you in the description so folks uh, can get a little bit of the get to know you. We're going to skip the get to know you and jump Great. right into the hard stuff. Okay. Um, so I want to ask a question about your candidacy for mayor, but I want to ask <laughs> it in a way that um, I think is relevant to the charter reform changes that have just happened. Sure. So the current mayor has pretty substantial power. They assign bureau, uh, they give bureau assignments. They can also like take all the bureau assignments for themselves. Oftentimes the mayor will keep some of the challenging bureau assignments like um the, the police bureau. And right now, if you're in charge of a bureau, you run the bureau. Post charter reform, by the time that you would take office, if you're successful in your candidacy for mayor, there'll be a professional city manager. The council will be a lot bigger. The mayor won't get to vote unless there's a tie. Um, right now, the mayor doesn't have veto authority, although we'll, we'll get to that question. So I guess my question is, why run for mayor at a moment when the challenges seem immense and it seems like the power is being taken away from that office? Um, That is a great question, uh, which I ask myself quite often. (laughs) But but I'll tell you, I'm I'm running for mayor because this is obviously a pivotal point in our city's history. You know, if you take a look at even the demographics from the last year, you saw that uh, Portland actually lost population. Mm. That is something which is exceptionally rare in Oregon history. If you look back at the last hundred years, uh, I think there have been three moments where uh, Portland has actually shrunk. One came with the um, with the timber economic crisis of the 1980s. I think you might go back to World War II. And then uh, last year. And so obviously we're at a pivot point. Um, I believe that Portland's best days are still ahead. However, um, you know, if we don't start to get the city back on the right track, we really could enter a doom spiral. And I believe that uh, the actions that our next generation of leaders take are going to determine the future of Portland. Um, I also think that, as you mentioned, you know, we are going to wake up on January 1st, 2025 to a profoundly new uh, form of government. And I think the first uh, uh, set of leaders that we send to city council under that new form of government are essentially like the founding fathers and mothers of Portland 2.0. Leadership at this moment is going to be especially important. Uh, There's both the rules that are on the paper and then the, frankly, the sort of governing norms that we establish for our new form of government. 
Um, I believe that I have the values and the leadership and the vision to actually help stand up our new form of government and make sure that it works for the people of Portland. I, I appreciate that optimism. My, my quick follow-up is, how are you conceiving of the new job of mayor? Like, what will the new mayor's job be? It's is are they are they like part cheerleader? Are they part like you know convener, consensus builder? Like, what is the new role with this new government? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, some of the answers to that, frankly, will be determined by who sure. is our new mayor and who gets elected to council. But if you look at the structure that we've passed, you know, frankly, um, it looks an awful lot like the division of responsibilities we see at the state level. At the state level, you have the state legislature, which essentially uh, creates policy, and then you have the governor's office and whatnot that actually implements this policy. Frankly, that's one of the reasons why I'm really excited about um running for mayor and being the next mayor. Um, although I love policy debates and whatnot, um, the thing that really drives me um, and motivates me to do this work is the implementation of policy. Um, I have uh, a lot of experience doing that. I'm both a political scientist with a PhD um, in government, so I've been studying this my entire life. I spend a lot of time thinking about how systems work. I also recognize that the that systems uh, are only as good as the people that you actually have um, inside those buildings. So that's what I'm really excited for. And frankly, this is, uh, I think this is great because, you know, I don't think the challenge in Portland is that we haven't extracted enough tax dollars from people's pockets to solve <laughs> our problems. I think our problems come from the fact that we have been terrible at implementing policy. I doesn't need to be this way, but in order to change things, we really do have to uh, take a different approach to the work that we do. I think well, that was the, the, the point you, that, oh, sorry, Ben. I was just going to say music to Reagan's ears, but yeah. Right. Go ahead, Reagan. <laughs> hey, Reagan. Oh, no. Oh, no. Government's broken. This is the first <laughs> time that's ever happened. Um, no. So, and you pointed out something that's interesting, Ben, when you talked about the way the bureaus are distributed. Right now, it would be like if you elected a legislature and then like the speaker, the speaker assigns committees, the Senate president assigns committees, but they don't assign the authority to run the agencies to them and no one should ever give Ben the authority to run an agency. We have no idea what he would do with it. Um, and me, so <laughs> Portland government has always struck me as being very strangely constructed and most people think so. And now there's been some changes. And so I kind of want to talk about those changes. Sure. I listened to, I was just camping and the week before I left to go camping, OPB, I think had an episode Part of it was about the charter reform changes yeah. and they did a really funny thing where they're like, they said, um, you know, um, <clears throat> you, you propose some alternative reforms. Um, several on the council have expressed, it's been a little unclear where everyone's at. There's yeah. been change. Everyone's kind of expressed or a lot of them have expressed the need to make some changes to it, but it sounds like nobody can agree on exactly what those are. And OPB did a funny thing, which I hate that journalists do, which is, well, you said we should change the charter and you also oppose the charter. Now, why do you want to be mayor? And I was like, well, that's a silly, unfair question. To me, it's like if we pass a policy in Oregon that I don't agree with, we should still try to make it as good as it can be, because if it's going to hurt people, I don't want it to hurt more people than it is already going to hurt. Right. Good examples like Measure 110 and stuff like that. So can you walk us through what some of your reforms look like and more so I want to hear the rationale behind them because I think that's the most helpful piece of information for people. Sure. And uh, thank you for asking this question because I, um, I think the reporting on this uh, has suffered from am some amnesia in terms of how things actually played out. If you go back a couple of years, uh, um, you know, every 10 years, Portland goes through a process of revising its charter. So we set to stand up a citizens group we, and we very much empower them to go out and come up with uh, whatever recommendations they have for adjusting our charter. And for uh, folks who are not familiar with this space, you should think of the charter as essentially being the constitution for the city. Uh, and as I would say there is a universal or near universal consensus of the city that our charter is antiquated and needs to uh, change. We've had this form of government for a hundred years. It's a commission form of government. We're one of the last cities in America to still use a commission form of government. Um, this is always an obscure and esoteric way to organize city governments. Um, 
most cities that explored this in the early 1900s abandoned it after a couple of years portland for because we are unique uh stuck with it for 100 years and we managed to make it work and frankly i think one of the reasons why we managed to make it work is for a long time for a lot of the 20th century portland was a much smaller town much less diverse town uh much easier to, to navigate and manage than the, the portland that we have today so as we go into uh, um, this charter reform process, the commission, the Citizens Commission that came up uh, that was charged with developing recommendations said, you know, we need to have a city manager. I completely agree with that. They also said we need to increase the number of uh, of um, seats on council. And frankly, that made sense to me, too. You know, we got four people representing the entire city probably we should grow a little bit. Then the Charter Reform Commission did a couple of things that I found to be uh, surprising. They said, uh, let's expand council by having um, by having uh, multi-member districts and using ranked choice voting. Um, and, you know, there have been some political jurisdictions that have done uh, multi-member districts, and there's some political districts, some political entities that have done ranked choice voting. Uh, I cannot find anywhere in America or, frankly, any place on the planet that does the combination of ranked choice voting plus multi-member districts. Um, and, frankly, at this point, I've lost the plot. I'm not sure what problem we are trying to solve with this, again, uh, unique on Earth system. And frankly, I think one of the challenges that Portland basically faces is just getting the basics right, being able to fill potholes, house the homeless, um, have an effective police department. Um, we have seen that we consistently fail with an esoteric form of government to uh, try to achieve that. Um, uh, and now we're embracing yet another esoteric form of government to try to um, solve our what i think are basically what portlanders are asking for is just a better functioning government but they did what they did um during the campaign about whether or not we should actually the voters should approve charter reform i made the argument that you know i am kind of concerned about these multi-member districts and ranked choice voting the combination of the two um makes me uh, number i'm just not sure what we're trying to fix here and frankly i have a phd in political science and i cannot tell you how this will play out uh, and I have to say, my PhD is all is exactly on this. I kind of model forms of government. This is a, a big stretch. Yeah, Ben, did you have a question? Yeah, just real quick on this one before you go on. So it seemed like last week there was a proposal to change some of this that I, just as a you know, distant observer was like, oh, they probably have the votes to actually do that. And then it got pulled back. Can you explain what happened there and why it's not moving forward? Sure. So, uh, um, yeah, absolutely. So during the campaign to, uh, 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 around charter reform, I raised these concerns and I said, hey, folks, we could do a much simpler thing. If, if charter reform fails at the ballot, I promise I'll come forward with another plan. Charter reform passed. So we have the government that we have. Uh, but, it, you know, the concerns I was raising about multi-member districts, ranked choice voting, uh, we haven't even gotten into the underdefined role that the mayor plays in the new form of government. These are all things that frankly, I just were not well articulated in the plan on the table. Um, however, you know, from my point of view, these are obvious concerns that we're going to have to address at some point. Uh, we also litigated this during the during the election. The people have just spoken, and now it's basically my job to try to implement this. I think my colleagues on council, especially if we've gotten closer and the implications uh, and the amb ambiguities around this uh, became more obvious, they got concerned and, and wanted to at least float a couple of uh, proposals to uh, to uh, make this a, a more straightforward uh, restructuring. And again, the proposals were to give the mayor a veto, shrink the number of people on council, and to adopt a, more, a simplified version of ranked choice voting. Um, I know for a fact that every every member of council kind of shares those concerns, but in practice, we're at a, I think a lot of people were concerned about the process. Uh, um, you know, uh, what do we do here? Do we go back and try to amend a policy before we've implemented it? Or do we implement the policy, see what challenges we have, um, and then explore reforms once we get there? I think, frankly, Although I very much agree with the concerns that Commissioner uh, Gonzalez and uh, Commissioner Ryan put forward, I think given democratic norms, we're kind of obliged to implement uh, implement charter reform as it was passed by the voters. Um, I'll tell you, um, while 
It won't be perfect. I am confident that the plan that we are implementing will be better than the status quo. Um, I'm also confident that we're going to have to um, make some adjustments as we move forward. And, you know, some of those might be referrals to the ballots. You know, some of that will be administrative work. Some of that will be work that council can be done. I fully expect to get sued because we get sued every day in the city. Uh, um, so there's going to be long processes. So, you know, here's, you know, if there's a message I want to give to Portlanders, um, it's this. Number one, real and fundamental change is coming to City Hall um, on January 1st, 2025. That is Portland local government 2.0. Um, at the same time, it is not the case that um, this is a one and done kind of deal. Uh, um, you know, we're going to wake up to a new form of government in 2025. Um, like every major policy that we implement, I expect that we will have years of adjustments and tweaks that we need to make in order to, to have the new form of government fit the city that we actually live in. And that's okay. I mean, that's the nature of government. You are literally never done building a city. So the the mayoral veto you expect will be on the ballot or? It's my, I mean... I don't. So what's clearly happened uh, um, in terms of the consensus in, in City Hall is I I think the proposals to uh, send um, uh, send voters the question of whether or not we should simplify ranked choice voting and whether we should shrink the number of, of seats on council. Um, I don't think anyone is pushing moving forward with that anymore. Um, frankly, I don't know where the mayoral veto um, uh, um, lands at this point. When I count the votes in the room, I don't see um, three votes for it. Um, I think the mayor said pretty clearly he was not supportive of that. Uh, while I do think a, mayor, a mayoral veto is, frankly, just kind of common sense, um, I basically of the opinion that um, we litigated at this at the uh, election where we passed charter reform. Uh, and the people have spoken, you know, uh, my plan is to march forward, implement this. You know, I find it a little bit crazy that we basically have set up a system where city council basically doesn't even have a mechanism for interacting with the mayor unless you have a rare incident where uh, there is a tied vote. Um, I think integrating the mayor into uh, the policy making process to some degree uh, would be wise. You know, this is a little bit like having uh, city planners not talk to city engineers. Um, you know, and I, I'm a guy who does infrastructure, you know, so we have planners who design big projects and engineers who implement big projects. And literally it happens every day when you go out in the real world and try to dig a tunnel, you discover that the, there's rock in the tunnel that you can't get through and you need to change plans. Right now in our current system, there's not really a way to for that information to flow back and forth between our planners and our implementers. I suspect that that will come back and bite us at some point. Uh, but we are actually going to ha have to play this out, go through the pain and look for solutions. Right. So that's my, I guess that's one thing I'm not 100% clear on. Is the mayor... The mayor doesn't have veto power, but are they responsible for directing the city manager to implement or no? That's also a great question. Something which is under um, specified is the relationship mm. between the mayor and the uh, city manager. I think the, mm. the mayor plays a role in picking the city manager. That's literally probably the first job that the mayor does and probably okay. the most important job. Uh, it needs to be confirmed by council. Uh, can the mayor give an order to the city manager? interesting I don't, I don't know and that's uh, exciting yeah and frankly <laughs> if the mayor could give uh you know if the mayor could give an order to this to the city manager could every other member of council give an order to, to the city manager probably you know so i think the city manager the most interesting job um in the city in our next form of government will be that uh city manager uh whoever she or he is you know they in practice will have you know 13 um bosses to report to a mayor and 12 members of council plus the 700,000 citizens of Portland. So um, I hope whoever has that job is um, sleeping well today because it's going to be awfully intense work. I was just going to say, it's going to take a very brave person to apply for uh, that job. Yeah, I, yeah, I think about that all the time, uh, <laughs> but I'm excited to get this person there. I, let, let me just take a minute to sure. talk about why, you know, we talk about in our current commission form of government, one of the challenges is, is that, uh, you know, we, we got 24 different bureaus 
is each is managed by um, a, a city commissioner, um, which in practice means that our current city government, and this is why Portland is the way it is, is we have five different mayors. Each is basically in charge of some aspect of government. I'm like your your infrastructure guy. I do roads, I do water, I do sewer, um, and I have an awful lot of direct control over that but you know i also need to intersect with parks and mm -hmm. uh the the planning division and the permits folks um and the fact that there's no mechanism to coordinate all that is one of the reasons why portland is such a hard place to you know start a business and grow a business or to solve a problem like houselessness or crime the city manager will be much more empowered you know she will be able to actually make the water bureau play nice with the Parks Bureau or whatnot, um, it's going to be much more efficient. You know, um, I think that um, change is really worth um, some of the other pain that we're going to go through. And, you know, we will solve the problems that emerge. And there's some I can see now, and I'm sure there will be many, many that I cannot foresee at this moment. That's great news. So I'm going to shift gears to something that made some headlines last week. There was a story in the Willamette Week about a letter from Governor Tina Kotek and Congressman Earl Blumenauer. I'll read an excerpt from the article. Governor Tina Kotek and U.S. Representative Earl Blumenauer are exasperated with the scale of untreated substance abuse on the streets of Portland, where both began their political careers in a May letter. Uh, newly obtained by Willamette Week, it expresses a rare level of frustration as two of the state's top elected officials exhorted Multnomah County Chair Jessica Vega-Peterson and Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler to do more to fix what they called a crisis. Uh, later in the article, uh, Peterson and Wheeler respond by basically saying, yeah, this crisis is because of inaction and lack of funding from the state and federal government. So they kind of put the fingers back at the uh, at the folks who wrote the letter. What do you make of the letter and the underlying argument? Like you all in city and county need to be doing more to solve this. Um, On this one, um, I'll tell you, I am. Uh, I largely agree with uh, the congressman and the governor. Um, uh, we obviously have a mental health crisis and a drug addiction crisis in this city, which is um, out of control and um, barely managed. Um, I. I recognize and see and I'm sympathetic to the mayor and the county chair who say we need more more resources for this. However, I'm also kind of skeptical of of that claim. You know, uh, you know, frankly, one of the promises of Measure 110 is that we would decriminalize drugs. But at the same time, one of the things we do is we'd shave off some cannabis taxes that we have and and devote and uh, direct that towards treatment programs. You know, I see us, I see that we have decriminalized drugs. However, I, I'm not seeing these new treatment programs come online. You know, that is, as we were saying earlier, I, that's an implementation problem. And it, um, uh, and I think if you were to compare how Portland or the metro area has done um, in this space, uh, we have done much worse compared to our peers. We got to get our act together. Um, you know, I have a, to be fair to the county chair, uh, um, you know, she is very new to this job. She's been in there for about six months. Um, however, in our, the way um, local governments work in the, in the Portland metro area, um, you know, the city basically deals with sticks and bricks. We do roads, sidewalks, parks, that kind of stuff. The county does human services, things like alcohol and drug treatment. Uh, frankly, one of the things I'm really looking to, for is for the county to um, get dramatically better at, uh, you know, serving people who are sleeping on the streets. And I know it's challenging. Um, I know the city has to, um, you know, be a, a partner here. However, um, I am not your alcohol and drug guy. Um, that is clearly a county responsibility. You know, we even give tens of millions of dollars to the county for those services, uh, but we have no influence over how those dollars are spent. Um, that is a crazy system and needs to change. And frankly, we've gone through a couple of county chairs and one mayor, and it hasn't changed. It's one of the reasons why a couple of weeks ago I voted against renewing the, the contract to renew the city's relationship with the joint office. Um, we are just dumping, you know, 30 plus million dollars a year into a system that number one has failed and the city has no influence over fixing beyond demanding that we sign a contract that clearly defines what's a city responsibility, what's a county responsibility, and what's a joint responsibility. And remarkably, um, there is an awful lot of friction in terms of actually just getting to a clear contract on who does what. 
Well, that what it's so interesting to me because I do think this comes back to like if you put yourself in the shoes of your average Portlander, yeah, or your average like statewide or national observer of Portland, no one is saying, "Wow, Multnomah County is a mess." Like Multnomah County's homelessness problem is. They're all saying the city of Portland is a mess. They can't solve problems. Like homelessness in Portland is a disaster. Um, but to your point, the levels of government and the distribution of authority exactly. makes it a very complex web to actually address. Um, and, you know, I, you know, that is uh, exactly right. And I am on this one, too. I kind of sympathize with the residents. I don't know if you should have to worry about, um, you know, which government is in charge of of providing mental health care and which government is in charge of picking up the trash. Um, you know, in addition to being a politician, I'm a Portlander and I just kind of want, you know, the, the, the poor guy who's screaming in the street to be connected with services. I want the trash that is, uh, you know, dumped outside my house to be picked up by somebody. Um, we just got to do better. Um, and again, uh, you know, we are, if you take a look at how many dollars we've dumped into uh, providing, just trying to solve the houselessness crisis, you know, we're, uh, in the last decade, easily hundreds, you know, more than a hundred million dollars, really hundreds of million do uh, of dollars. And frankly, every year the problem has gotten worse. Um, well, you know, I, the, state, the state's about to send more and I, we'll see if that helps. I think there's a lot of the folks on my side of the aisle in the Republican aisle who do not think that we have um, in terms of building actual homes, we don't have the workforce to do it. We don't have the companies that are out there to do it. We don't have the land supply to do it. And so you're plowing money into a place that it's going to get backlogged. And then on the reg and then on the home on the homelessness services side, we don't have the infrastructure on uh, mental health. We don't have the infrastructure because the state has basically absolved themselves of dealing with the mental health crisis. They yep. said local, good luck. And then now we all have to build facilities that won't be operational for you know five years at the right. at the least. But this disagreement about levels of government goes all the way back to the founding and before our country. Yep. It's like, what should this the federal government do? What should the state government do? And every single year in the legislature, there's disagreements about what the state should do and what the city should do and what the county should do. And everybody's pointing finger. And so it's like not a new problem whatsoever. So I want to ask my um, last question here. So at in national media, I think pretty much every time Oregon makes news or Portland makes news. It's usually bad. It's not like, oh, look at this great things that Oregon and Portland are doing. It's like, nope, here we go. We've fallen flat on our faces again. And and sometimes it's it's um they're playing it up a little bit and sometimes it is true. But so then that causes especially the national Republican media to hold Portland up as a boogeyman, the the worst place in the country to live. Look at all the crazy stuff they do. Aren't you know, don't let anywhere else be like Portland. And even within Oregon, there's that sentiment. Oh, yeah. Portland, my Clackamas County. Right. Yeah. And so but then there's sort of some on the left who hold up Portland as like, no, this is like the ideal place to live. Actually, this is what we want every city to look like. What is your view on like what Portland is now how and how you feel about Portland or how Portlanders feel about Portland and what it should become? Uh, that's a great question. And, you know, I, I believe that Portland is literally one of the best cities in North America. Um, you know, it's, we live in a beautiful spot. You can see the river. You know, we got beautiful rivers. We got beautiful mountains. Uh, um, people come to live in Portland because of the quality of life. Um, while that the quality of life has deteriorated a little bit in recent years, I am very confident that we can turn it around. At the same time, you know, it's also true that houselessness has exploded. Uh, violent crimes have exploded. Retail theft um, has exploded. The cost of living here has also increased exponentially. These are real challenges that um, have fundamentally changed the experience of being a Portlander. You know, I think a lot of Portlanders are frankly, kind of in mourning for the city that uh, we enjoyed just not that long ago. It's it's kind of crazy that that Portlandia moment when we were sort of the envy of the world was kind of, you know, seven years ago or something like that. Uh, um, so the truth, you know, both things can be true. Portland is still a great place to live. We got incredible challenges. Um, you know, a, a one version of this question is, what do we do do about this? I do think that we've kind of gotten a raw deal. If you take a look at national media, that you know, they're, you know, Portland has become a, a whipping boy, and I think 
part of just a rhetorical tool in some larger political debates. So the question is, how do we turn that around? Well, you know, you can't market your way out of this, or I am not inclined to try to market my way out of this. Mm -hmm. You know, there are real challenges. If we want to improve our reputation, the way we do that is doing a better job of housing folks. We do a better job of getting up folks who are drug addicted connected to uh, um, addiction services. You know, we do a better job of, of you know, bringing down retail theft and uh, violent crimes. You know, those are big challenges, but it's not rocket science big challenges. It's not a Mars moonshot. We know how to do this. You know, I've been on this council for two years, and I think we've made incredible progress in terms of getting some people off the street, dealing with livability, implementing policies that make it easier to, um, you know, start a business and grow a business in town, uh, to keep people safe, too. You know, we've increased the size of the police force while also demanding accountability. So, you know, starting this fall, uh, you will both see more police officers in Portland, and there will be a body cam on every police officer's uh, shoulder. You know, I think these are the kinds of common sense reforms that we just have to have the political will and the discipline to implement. And as we get things like that right, I think the reputation um, that we enjoy in the national media will begin to turn around. That's awesome. And if you have time for just one follow-up sure, on that of course. point. Um, we did talk in our first conversation with you, I think it was almost two years ago now, a lot about public safety. Yep. Um, and at the time there was, uh, I think you were, you were talking about how there just weren't enough police officers and it took 18 months to train a police officer. Yep. And there's this big backlog. Even recently, I just saw this article last week that was just terrifying about a Japanese diplomat who got assaulted in the street. And I do think there's this sense of like from suburban folks, like, Ooh, I don't know if I want to go to Portland to go shopping or for dinner. I don't know if it's safe. Like there's this public safety fear. Do you, is that, is that a founded fear? Um, or, and, or you've talked about some, you just mentioned some of the progress about how things are shifting. What do you, how do you think of the state of public safety in the city right now? Well, here's what I'd say. You know, if you are, if you don't spend a lot of time, let's, and let's just pick downtown Portland. And downtown Portland is actually a really important case study, both because downtown is critical to the economic viability of the city of Portland. And frankly, um, it is vital to the economic vitality of the state of Oregon. It is also the case that certainly during the pandemic years, downtown Portland um, was a mess. We both had rioting. It was a sort of canyons and canyons of plywood uh, mm -hmm. as people were boarding up their windows. Uh, Many tents on every corner, fentanyl, um, mm. smoke, uh, billowing through the streets like it was fog. Um, just a true nightmare. Um, however, if you haven't been to downtown Portland uh, in a while, I really encourage you to go. Um, you know, maybe pick a, a an afternoon if you're if you're truly cautious or concerned. Uh, I think you will discover that downtown Portland looks very different from the way that you see it on TV and the way you might have remembered it being a couple of years ago. Uh, at the same time, we still have some challenges, but frankly, I think one of our challenges now is that a lot of people left downtown Portland during the pandemic, and the uh, office towers that surround me are to a significant degree vacant um, hmm. which is its own sort of economic crisis which frankly um, is looming but will start to become uh, very apparent very soon um, so it's much safer the livability part is much better uh, is it perfect? No. Um, however, I do want you to know that if you go back two years, uh, we were struck, you know, cops were leaving the bureau in droves and we couldn't hire a cop because our reputation was so bad. Hmm. We've really, and this is one of the things I was really tried to do is change the uh, dynamics of the conversation around public safety here in the city. Um, obviously, yeah, I'm a, as will be a, a, a parent to people who, who, who know me. I'm an African-American single dad. I got two kids, uh, boys, 12 and 14. Uh, justice in uh, policing is very important to me. Uh, I literally got skin in this game. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, you know, I think that we, I very much believe that we have to have a, a public safety system that treats everybody with dignity and professionalism. Um, frankly, I think that we've implemented the reforms and a new culture that achieves that. You know, I think we've also have changed the conversation about what we expect from our police department, uh, which means that today, you know, actually, we are we're doing a better job of recruiting police than 
most jurisdictions in the in hmm. most cities in America. We have really turned that around. That's exciting. The bad news is it does take 18 months to train up po police officers. So a lot of those cops are in the pipeline now, but they're not necessarily out on the street. But we will start to see that change literally every month. And we do. I, I can tell you, I, like every, I try to go to our police swearing in ceremonies. And one of the unique things about this moment in history is there are actually police swearing in ceremonies. For the first couple of years I was here, that wasn't a thing that was happening because we weren't doing because we weren't hiring so we are um we're turning the corner on the public safety piece we got a lot a long way to go um you know but uh, you know when i came in two years ago we were shrinking the police department we we're getting rid of uh traffic enforcement and now especially in the last six months or so you know we've brought back traffic enforcement to some degree we have uh retail uh police uh missions going on we have car theft missions going on we're really beginning to um turn things around here in Portland. I think that we're still um, about three or four years to actually getting to where we want to be as a city. But, you know, I will point out that I believe that within three or four years, we can actually uh, get back. Um, I can't say get back to Portland that we all love, but I think that we can continue to build an even better Portland. Um, I'm excited about that. I think this is very much within the realm of possibility. However, it's not a guarantee. You know, I think the choices that we make um, over the next couple of years are going to be the difference between whether or not Portland is a city that um, thrives again, where uh, you feel like you can take your kid downtown to a, go shopping or go out to lunch, or whether or not we have a downtown that is ghost town. Mm -hmm. Well, Commissioner Maps, it is nice to hear someone speaking with optimism about the city of Portland. Uh, thank you for, for coming on the podcast. If folks want to learn more about you or your campaign, uh, where would you direct them? Oh, go to MingusMaps.com. Uh, I have a web page up. You can go and uh, um, find out what we're up to, where we're going to be. Um, we didn't talk about it a lot, but I will be. I am running for mayor. Um, I think of democracy as not only being the vote that we take on election day, but the conversation that we have uh, um, over the course of the campaign. Uh, we're looking at a November 2024 campaign. So from for the next 18 months or so, I'm going to be out uh, talking to Portlanders where they're at hearing what's important to them and trying to um, develop a Portland consensus on how we can move forward together. Awesome. Thanks again That's for coming awesome. on the pod and we'll hopefully have you back soon. I uh, please. I'd, I'd love to. Uh, it's always fun to talk to you guys. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Reagan. This was a great conversation and please do uh, have me back. I'd love, especially I uh, let me put a plug in for this too. Yeah. Um, in terms of implementing charter reform, when we get to the fall, basically after um, Halloween, uh, um, I think we're going to be at an important inflection point for the implementation of our of charter reform. Uh, I encourage people to pay attention to this space. I, by the time we get to November or something, I think we'll have a pretty good idea of what our next form of government is going to look like at a granular level. Uh, so um, if you want to invite me back then, I think that we'll have a lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah. So you mean this November, not November 24. Yeah. So we have to budget into like uh, we're basically starting to pull together our our, our budget for the next fiscal year. Uh, the next that budget will be the first budget of uh, of the new form of government. So we have to figure out, you know, there are things like how many people on council and how you go about electing them. That's important. But actually, the the far more important thing, frankly, is like, how do we fund different bureaus? Do do we merge some bureaus? Um, do we eliminate some bureaus? Um, all of those kind of implementation questions are basically what we're spending the summer working on. Um, and it'll be fascinating. I would say at this hour, a lot of stuff is still undecided, but because we have to actually pull together a budget, some decisions are gonna be made literally over the course of the next couple of weeks that have dramatic implications for the future of our city. All right. Well, in that case, we will see you back here in November. <laughs> All right. I look forward to it. Thanks. See you next time. All right. Thank have you. Have a great, have a great day, guys.